You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 105, The Dental Guys Book Club, part two, Zero Bone Loss Concepts by Tomas Linkovicus. This week on The Dental Guys, John and I tackle the next chapters in Zero Bone Loss Concepts. We discuss, does your surgeon need a perio probe for your next surgery? And how about this idea that we're placing implants subcrestal to augment soft tissue? What does all this mean? Do you need a new implant system? We're going to discuss this and much more this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And man, you know, Wes, this has been a fun, you know, after last show, when we started this this kind of segment, if you call it that, you know, we recorded the first intro to the show and I, and I introed the show and really I, I later discovered that I should have called it something different. Mm. I should have called it, which is what it's titled now, the Dental Guys Book Club. Book it. Because, because yeah, book it. Because the, de- I mean, book clubs are hey, listen, all, if the, you're, all the rage, dude. If you're and a this child is, of the this... 70s and 80s, you remember Book It? I'm going to stop you just right there for a minute, John. <laughs> Do you remember Book It? A Pizza Hut campaign to get children to read books, right? Do you remember I, that? I kind of do. Maybe yeah, I, but like I kind of do. It, book It was like, read a book. I'm looking it up online, but... The Book It program still exists, right? And Pizza oh, really? Hut still has it. Yeah, there okay. it is. Bookitprogram.com. Huh. Right? I mean, and basically it's essentially, you know, talking about literacy and all that type of thing and, and learning how to so read. So we're basically back. we're basically bringing you back by having this this Dental Guys Book Club. Because book clubs are all the rage, usually with the ladies. I'm not saying yeah. that in a sexist way, but that's yeah, you typically get your been like, yeah, you get your pumpkin spice latte mm-hmm. and you get your, you know, somewhat controversial book and you politely discuss, you know, what's going on. And But we take it the other direction and we're like, we're diving in. So yeah, this well, book, welcome we're going to gonna continue book with. Club. Yeah, welcome to the book club. Have a, have a latte. Take a seat over there and have a latte. Um, but, you know, this... I think that that this is one of the weirdest weeks at the Dental Guys because <clears throat> this week we received the Academy of Austin Integration annual meeting registration packet. And every year we get this packet, and as you guys know, have been listening to the show for a while, we are big about the AO and we're big on this meeting. We've been going forever, and uh, I think I've gone to 10 straight meetings, and it is, it is amazing, uh, except two years ago, as you guys know, we did it. We couldn't go. And we did the video review of it. We actually got the videos. But anyway, so every year they send out the registration packet. And, and, and Wes and I always are taking pictures of the, P, the lineup, right? Mm. It's this thing we do. We look, we look at it. We go, oh, man, have you seen the lineup? We Page start seven, take a picture. Oh, that's going to be amazing. Day two. But the weirdest thing happened this year, guys. Well, yesterday, my periodontist took a screen cap of a page and it has our face on it. Our right? faces. And are it was like, in. dude, congratulations. And I'm like, man, I'm still pinching myself over here. It's I so mean, weird. Cause guys, we're gonna be speaking at the AO meeting. And you know, I mean, I I I, I don't know what to think about it because I mean, don't get me wrong, like we we try to do a good job with the show and we want it to be high level and you guys know that, but this is something where, you know, uh, we've always said, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you are. And mm-hmm. that is certainly what this meeting has always been to us, has been people that are much smarter than we are. So we're just honored to get a little piece of that. But to see our picture on the registration thing was a little crazy. And we're excited because we're going to be talking about it. The Young Clinicians Luncheon mm-hmm. is where we're speaking. 
And um, we're going to talk about some interesting things because if you've listened to the show, right. you know that we talk a lot about the influence of what we're doing as well as what others are doing in, say, the social media realm or the podcast realm. And is that good or bad for dentistry, right? Like we think it can be potentially good, but we also think it can be potentially harmful depending on if you're evidence-based or if you're just kind of spouting off whatever you think about something. And so I, I think that the AO and these organizations are trying to figure out how to plug in in a positive way to that social media side and getting their message out. But they're fighting against these, these weird forces of, you know, people just getting up and just saying, this is what I think, this is what I do without any backing. So it's going to be a good talk, I think, Wes. Yeah, I'm excited about uh, the whole thing. I mean, and, and, and a matter of fact, just if you aren't going to make it to Seattle, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to be doing online that week, March 18th through the 21st, 2020. If you can be there, come up and see us, uh, shake our hand, give us a shout out. Uh, we're, we're certainly open to that kind of thing. And Yeah, I'm, and if you're going to be at the meeting, you should register for the Young Clinician's Luncheon. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to be a young clinician to do that, but no, come no. check us out because we want to pack the place out, of course, and have a good turnout. And if it's fans of ours, hey, if you're going to be around Seattle, if you want to come to the AO, if you've never been to the AO, let me let me this just say it this way. This is it. This, this is, is it. I mean, it was there it's a few the years ago. It's the 35th anniversary, right? It's the exactly. 35th year anniversary. It was there a few years ago, and I had a blast. I love Seattle. Mm. Uh, the downtown is amazing. It's all just such a great walking city. Uh, great convention center. So, I mean, it's the place to be. And so come on out to the meeting and check out what, what's going on at the meeting. If you if you manage to see us there, give us a shout, but you will not be disappointed by this meeting. Super excited about it, John. Uh, next week, next week we're going to be, uh, and this will be for you guys that are listening to this now, it's already passed, but next week we're heading down to a CE course down in Dallas, Texas. Yep. And... What I think it's great about this course, it's going to feed right into this next chap chapter. Yeah, we're going to be going to take uh, taking a course from Pat Allen on soft tissue augmentation around teeth and dental implants. How to thicken soft tissue around teeth and dental implants. We want to kind of get the protocols. When we were out at Spear recently, Bob Winter gets up and he starts talking about. Uh, some periodontal um, phasing and treatment, uh, basically yeah. how to do certain periodontal procedures and how to work with <clears throat> a restoring doctor and how to communicate with your periodontist and all the things that kind of go with treating recession and crown lengthening and yep. implant stuff, surgically facilitated orthodontics. And guess who Bob Winter has paired up with over the years in writing papers and research? None other than Pat Allen. We were super excited to hear that Bob was friends with him and is actually going to continue to work with Pat um, in Bob's practice there in uh, Southern California. Yeah. So we were pumped because that's something that we'd been wanting to do for a long time uh, and, and possibly incorporate some of these simpler things into our practice. Yeah, at very least, to, we want to understand it. You know, yeah. at very least, we want to know how are some of the best in the world, like Pat Allen, doing tissue grafting, how much of it is alloderm, how much mm. of it is, you know, autogenous, um, what, what kind of technique is he using? And yeah. I'm really interested to hear how he looks at this around implants because, yeah. you know, we, we all know no matter where your background is from, we, we know that soft tissue grafting around teeth has been around forever. And there's been a lot of more controvert, a lot more controversy around grafting, around implants or grafting in preparation for implant placement. And Wes, really, I think that's a perfect segue, right? Because yeah. what really got us thinking about this in the end wasn't because we wanted to graft recession defects. <laughs> it was because this book that we're about to embark on, Dental Guys Book Club Part 2, uh, talking about uh, zero bone loss concepts, well, Link of Vicious originally was what got us thinking, hey, if we don't have enough soft tissue, that might affect the bone loss around our implants. So, well, how much soft tissue do you need? <clears throat> right. Well, that's what how we're going to talk about. Yeah, that's what yeah. we're going to talk about here next, right after a word from our sponsor. 
Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbread here with Financially Simple. In the last episode, I introduced you to the concept of a multiple used in valuation. Now the multiple is mainly comprised of intangible assets. Now, intangible assets, as I've already introduced, are simplified into four different types of capital. Remember, you have the structural, the social, the human, and the customer capital. In order to increase the intangible assets, we must segment the business into the eight key areas of function. Now, as we've discussed, the eight key areas are planning, leadership, marketing sales, people operations, finance, and legal. Going forward throughout the season, we're gonna analyze each of these eight key areas with the goal of increasing your value. I'm looking forward to helping you dominate your dental marketplace. If you have any questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. All right, and we're back uh, after that word from our sponsor. And so here we go. Dental Guys Book Club, Zero Bone Loss Concepts by Tomas Nikovicius. Let's jump right into this, Wes, because this next chapter, we left you guys off after the first three. We're getting into chapter four this time. Mm. And really, this is the chapter that he has been writing for 10 years. He's mm -hmm. been writing this chapter ever since he first published these studies that were indicating that implants with a certain amount of soft tissue thickness were losing less bone than implants that had less. So let's jump right into this chapter. Let's first dis dis just define what is the soft tissue around implants. And it's interesting, Wes, and I won't dive too deep into this, but we just had a very interesting conversation with somebody about what is around implants, right? What is the actual tissue that is up against the implant shoulder, up against the implant itself. And, you know, I think we it's important that we understand that, you know, not everybody knows this, and that's okay. So if you don't know, you might be thinking, okay, what's around a tooth? We got a PDL, a periodontal ligament. Well, implants don't have a periodontal ligament because we don't have cementum that we can attach to. So what do we have? Well, we have bone, obviously, up to a certain point, and then we have junctional epithelium. And this junctional epithelium uh, runs from where the micro gap is. We talked about micro gap in previous episodes. So this is where the, the abutment and the implant join. And it extends upward. And then there's connective tissue. And that connective tissue, jun the junctional epithelium, connective tissue, and the cellular epithelium are what form the biologic width, if you will, around an implant. So it's important we know which tissues are there. It's important we know that that tissue uh, thickness has been really studied for a long time. There's been a question about what does this do for the implant and, and does the amount matter? And so Linkovicius starts to talk about how he's measuring first the vertical soft tissue thickness. And basically he's measuring from the crest of bone to the top of the epithelial tissue. So essentially it's bone sounding, as you can think of this as bone right. sounding uh, on, on the ridge. And I think a lot of times, so, so when we talk about biologic width, as dentists, we understand biologic width. We understand that if you do not have enough width of your tissue, that you're either going to have chronic inflammation or you're going to have bone loss. So you can't put your crown margin, you know, violating that biologic width without expecting potential of some consequences. So it does that apply to implants? And interestingly, I, th I think there's some maybe simplistic idea that the more tissue we have around implants might mean the more blood supply and that that's as simple as that. But what we talk about in this chapter, what he talks about in this chapter is that there's some protective part of this as well. It's not only mm -hmm. blood supply, which is important for bone maintenance, but it's also protection well, let's talk against about this bacteria. You've kind of set this up nicely for, you know, the first thing I think that is kind of paramount in any implant practice right now and what's definitive is we need to start measuring 
the soft tissue thickness in our surgical sites. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you know, you can do that a couple of different ways. John, you mentioned one, bone sounding. We're measuring the vertical soft tissue thickness. Uh, we're me measuring the horizontal soft tissue thickness from a buckle to buckle plate, say, fashion. And then also taking note of the attached gingiva. Where is the attached and free gingiva uh, going to be ending up? Like, where is that demarcation and in, in what is truly attached? And how does that work with, you know, so many times I think a surgeon, they don't even think restoratively. How does your crown emerge out? So start thinking three-dimensional. Right. And just, just when you make your incision, before you lay your flap, right, or when you're doing heel ridge surgery, right? Make your incision, pull back, say say you made a crest of the ridge incision, just pull back the tissue a little bit, take a perio pro before swelling takes place, and just measure the yep. thickness of your soft tissue. And he take shows that, this in the chapter, how he yeah, measures that how, during how surgery. That. Yeah, and, and then so also, you can pre-op do it or you can do it during surgery. Yeah, you can pre-op do it. I think there's ways to do it on uh, CT uh, too. Uh, I think you got to be very careful about that because, um, you know, that might not be as accurate as, mm -hmm. it won't be as accurate, but it'll be a, a good estimation. Helps you to do guided surgery um, yep. appropriately with respect to the soft tissue. And yep. so, you know, So that's up, true. And and that's, that's, that's the main crux of this is knowing where we start with, because you have to define how to measure this first. And as Wes is saying, you got to know, but his, his initial thought is because this epithelium, junctional epithelium is essentially there. He talks about, there's a clean zone that's attached to the implant without mm -hmm. having bacteria. And then there's the plaque zone above that. And he's basically saying, okay, so if this is protective, then the thickness surely must have an effect. And the first breakthrough study that they did a long time ago was a dog study showing that in implants where they thinned, purposefully thinned the tissue in the test implants um, without thinning it in the control group, that they found a, a consistent amount of bone resorption uh, in the areas where there was the thinning of the tissue. And, and this really got them thinking that this there may be something to this. So then, 2003, 2003, they made the first uh, observations. It says of crustal bone loss that turned out to be the result of soft tissue thickness, mm -hmm. and they put implants in with X hex that were super crustal, and they found these defects before the implants were even loaded. Defects in the bone, and they started asking, well, could it be that this soft tissue thickness mattered? And you know, we can go through all of the studies, I would urge you to just search, either get this book or, or just get on PubMed and you can read the studies for yourself. But one of the things that I think really got us thinking about this is he did a, a study where he had platform shifted implants or platform switched implants and non-platform shift implants and found that even with platform switching, that you couldn't completely avoid or you could not avoid uh, loss of bone. And, and up until that time... With, you know, with thin tissue, that is. Yeah. Up until that time, the studies with platform shifting, guess what they didn't measure? Soft, Soft tissue, tissue thickness. thickness. And this and is so, where I picked up this thing. So, you know, all of the studies going on and people that are smarter than we are, Wes, they probably already knew this, right? Right. Because the first person that I knew that mentioned this to me who was smarter than us was Steve Chu. So yep. I'm listening to a lecture back, it was in the Biomet days when when she was speaking a lot for Biomet. I was down at Biomet's center in Florida. I remember, I remember you actually calling me. Oh, I did. I called you. Because he got up there and literally in the middle of everything. I mean, he's not really supposed to be talking about this per se. And he goes, guys, we we're all wrong. We're wrong. We, we're wrong about what we've been measuring. And you know All what's interesting, John, is that I'm sitting here saying I place, you know, I was placing an implant at the time. You weren't placing at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting here saying, dude, I, I place all my implants just, you know, at the crest or slightly subcrestal. Yep. And you were like, yeah, I just don't know if it matters or not, you know? And I'm like, well, yeah. I don't know if it matters either, but I'm doing it because the protocol says to do right. it, right? Right. I didn't and know he, what I was doing. No, we didn't right? even know what we knew. And so he's, that's exactly what he said. He gets up there and goes, guys, there's this guy 
Linkovicious, who we've been following. Mm. He said, we've been following this. He said he just got back from Lithuania visiting his office, looking at his group, what they do. He goes, this guy's legit. And he said, what they're finding is that when you measure soft tissue thickness, if you look at that, you're going to find that if you don't put it in adequate thickness, we're seeing bone loss. And he goes, that's regardless of the implant connection, regardless of the implant system. Yeah, that's regardless. when he came back because I was like this big connection guy at the time. And I still am a connection guy. Yeah. We talk about that in this book here. Sure. How connection does matter. If you're going to put an implant subcrestal, you better have a daggone good connection. So, right. you know, I lucked out and got right on that one. But really... It doesn't really matter if you had a good connection or not. If you don't have yep. soft tissue thickness above the head, like we're talking vertical thickness yep. above the head of your implant, you will have bone loss. And we're going to talk about how much, but just hear us out right now that well, here's what I want you to do, because you know what's going to happen? It's it's the same. It's the stages of grief. Okay. I love to talk about this. The first stage of grief, right, is denial. So I guarantee right. you there's lots of people here who you are hearing this for the first time and you're like, no way, man. No way. Hey, John, I'm, let me ask you this question. Does, does the soft tissue around your implants just get better over time? Does it like get it, better over time? Does it just like get better? Like after that, let's just say after the first, say, year to two years of healing, maturation. Yeah. Right? Looks does pretty it just nice. Get, does it just get better over time? Like I love it when someone says this. It's, uh, I'm getting a little bit of grain around my implant and like that happens in the first year and the surgeon says, that's just going to get better over time. <laughs> All right. You know, and this is where you start kind of looking at your cases and you're like, no, right. That's not going to get better. It's probably going to progress. Yep. And you better pray. So right? denial though, you're, you're in denial right now, guys, if you're in girls, if you're going, No. Not No, that's not the case. If you have a good connection, you can put the implant wherever you want. It has nothing to do with that. It's the connection. It's my abutments. It's whatever. Okay, so what I want you to do, if you're in denial, is I want you to go back and I want you to look, and this is what Chu told us to do. He said, go back and look at bite wings before implants were placed, bite wings. Mm -hmm. Look mm -hmm. at the soft tissue thickness and then start looking at your cases that have cupping of the bone. And he's like, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it messed with us me and Dennis Tarnow, yeah. he says, because we were like, oh my goodness, we're seeing it. We're, we didn't realize it. It's usually posterior mandibles, the easiest place to see it because you can get good bite wings back there and the tissue's often thin. And he said, so we're having to totally rethink. And then he made the statement at the Biomet Center. He said, it doesn't matter what implant you have if you don't have adequate thickness. And as Wes said, what that started to get us thinking is... If you had an implant that was protocol designed to be placed subcrestal, okay, every time, then what you're doing is every time by kind of countersinking that implant, you are increasing your soft tissue thickness by placing your implant deeper, and therefore you're going to see less bone loss. Was it ever the subcrestal placement that did it, Wes? No. It was not the subcrustal placement. It was partially the soft tissue thickness and partially the connection, but partially the, and maybe majorly the soft tissue thickness. And so then you start looking back at your cases and you start mm -hmm. seeing it. And now the other thing is, Wes, why do immediates tend to look pretty good? So this because is Because we're always thing. putting them where from the fusion of margin? Three millimeters. Yeah. Yeah. So millimeters. we always have good soft tissue thickness. That's why they seem to work pretty well. Yeah. You know, you start setting your implants three to four millimeters uh, sub gingival, uh, sub from the uh, from the free gingival margin and immediates. This is where you see this. I feel like that this is like one of the reasons why we started seeing like excellence in dental implant dentistry is that we started doing immediates. Yes. And then, you know, I, so this kind of like supports. One of the theories um, that that Tomas kind of embodies, which is a really kind of what Mish in contemporary implant dentistry talks about, is volume. 
Yep. When you have the appropriate amount of volume, Mish did a study and he looked at bone volume and he said his big thing was bone, right? And he said whenever you take implants and they look at like a retro, like multi studies, they look all of these studies back backwards, okay? And they say, okay, take all the implants that were placed with respect to bone, yep. 1.5 millimeters all the way around. The success rate, now we're not talking about bone loss, we're talking about success rate of the implant is 99% successful. Yep. So volume is key, right? So now let's add another layer of soft tissue on top of that bone of 1.5 millimeters. Let's add three millimeters yep. of soft tissue thickness from the top of your tissue down to the implant interface, meaning that means you're working <clears throat> subgingival three millimeters at least. Mm -hmm. right? That's at least three millimeters. That's you have proper blood supply and proper protection. This plaque zone, yep. this protection zone. You you know, like I like saying this too, is that Sharpie's fibers only go in one direction around a dental implant, and that is circumferential. And it's totally different in a tooth. They embed into the side of a tooth, all yep. this stuff. Implant soft tissue is not protective. And so therefore you better have enough vertical right. soft tissue. And, and we, we want you guys to, to, cause I want to get to his discussion about why is the bone resort, but I want to focus just for a moment on like, there's a, t I want you guys to understand there's a ton of studies on this now. Yeah. Okay. At first, at first when Shu was talking about this back in, I think it was 2012, he was talking about this. 2012, Chu picked up on it. But since that time, they've done studies, follow-up on, on platform shifting. Other groups have verified this. JPD just had in their annual review last year uh, to kind of a definitive statement saying, yes, this matters. Um, we know that the studies support this. Again, it's not the only thing that matters, but it matters. So I don't want to go through that, but I do want to say let's define the thickness. So the thickness he mm -hmm. measured that... He questioned first. He said, okay, thick was three millimeters and greater. Mm -hmm. And then he did some studies even to look at what about 2.5? Yeah, what about thresholds? What are the thresholds? And so the bottom line is three millimeters, even down to 2.5, you don't see as good of a result. And so three millimeters really is the level that he recommends as, the, as where you need to shoot for. Hey, if so you the, ever come to RDI, yeah, you know whenever we're teaching – the series one day one course yep you will see a decision tree right and that decision tree follows the research that's in this book exactly and 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 tomorrow because we think that you have to look at this and it's another reason why does it now make sense folks why we're going to take pat allen's course because if you have insufficient soft tissue and you have anatomy say your inferior inferior alveolar nerve is such a position that you can't put a shorter implant in, right? It's, uh, you know, you, you've already gone as short as you feel like you can, but your tissue's thin, you may want to augment your tissue yeah, so that you can not, so you're not going to lose bone if you have thin tissue. So his, his, the next question here is why might it be that this is happening, right? Is it a uh, blood supply? What is it? And what he basically says is that the presence of bacteria is the reason behind bone loss around implants during the formation of biologic width. So it's suggested, as he says, that bacteria and plaque must be a certain distance from the bone level. If this distance is less than required, the bone resorbs to create sufficient distance for protection. So if you place an implant into thin tissue mm -hmm. and say the tissue's one millimeter thick, what this would tell us is that that tissue, the bone, will resorb by two millimeters <laughs> in order to recreate a biologic width of a total of three millimeters of soft tissue thickness. So if you're putting an implant into one millimeter thick tissue, you'd better do something. You'd better either place the implant deeper in well, anticipation. Minute, he, actually, he actually talks a little bit about there's four ways you can yeah, do this. Yeah, four right? ways. That's there's right. four ways you can do this. And I think it's great that he lines these four ways out because it's exactly what, you know, 
I would recommend for the yep. for the for the listen for the person that's doing ninety percent of all the implants you're going to do in your practice. Mm-hmm. This right here could change your patient's teeth and implants. Yep. for their lifetime. It's a big right? deal. It's yep. a big deal. So there's four things. There's four things he mentions. One first thing he says is he said first thing you can do to increase the soft tissue thickness in a healed ridge approach is flatten the alveolar ridge before the implant's placed. So basically, most of the time, whenever you lay a flap, you have this peak of bone. I was looking at with a patient today on their CT, and I was saying, you know, I'm going to take that bone and I'm going to level that out. And that guy, the, the guy was a farmer, and he was like, well, that only makes sense. You kind of make a flat place to work on. And I said, yeah, it actually helps us out in several different ways. It makes our tissue, we have more tissue to deal with then. So you just thicken the tissue by flattening the alveolar ridge. Number two, hey, if you have an implant that allows you to place it subcrestal, the ones we've talked about in the previous chapters, then you place your implant subcrestal. So, yep. for instance, most of the implants that John and I place are replacing one millimeter subcrestal. And then number three, how about the tent pole technique? We'll get into that in the subsequent chapters, basically <clears throat> using a hilly, healing abutment and releasing the tissues to tent pole this up when there's insufficient bone. Tent this tissue and grow bone. You're basically doing hor- you're doing vertical, vertical yep. tissue. Tissue, cr- but, yeah, tissue thickening. Tissue will grow in under right, this under. tent pole, right? And then bone and soft tissue, mm-hmm. and then and then the third, the fourth one is why we're going to Pat Allen's course, yep. right? Because we don't understand it as well as we want to. We want to know the protocol master, right, to show us this fourth approach: vertical soft tissue augmentation. And here's what Tomas says with various augmentation techniques. You know, right. so what are those techniques? He gets into some of those things in the in the previous in the next chapters, but these are ways to um, augment yeah. the thickness of the tissue. Yeah, and something the goal with this chapter is to is to establish in your mind, first of all, that soft tissue thickness is really it's one of the things that you may have missed that we missed for a lot of years. It's one of the things that I think as we get it out there more, it's going to make implant manufacturers more and more mad because they're going to have a harder time if you take into account, if somebody says, so let's say an implant manufacturer comes to you, Wes, tomorrow, because I, I've got a meeting with one. I'll have to tell you about it later who's coming in, who heard about us. And let's say they come Heard about in, the dental guys or yeah, heard about RDI? The dental, the dental guys. <laughs> so, so let's say an implant manufacturer comes into your office next week and they say, hey, we are a major implant manufacturer. We've been around forever. We've, we've, you know, we have all this money. We're really good. And you want, let me show you a study that supports that our implant after 10 years only loses an average of 0.3 millimeters of bone. Whereas our competitor, let me show you the competitor after 10 years lost 1.5 millimeters. What, Wes, let's kind of get brass tacks here. What are you now thinking after knowing this chapter about what is that does that really maybe mean now to you versus what it used to mean to you man these are the people th- these people hate me right <laughs> like i had a rep walk in today and she and I, he was introducing me to somebody else and and i rattled off something and he was like yeah he does his research right yeah. so these people don't like me because I really kind of call them out on some stuff like i'm looking at these studies and i'm saying what well, did y'all measure vertical soft tissue thickness you know crickets you know and i have yet uh, uh. to ever hear any implant manufacturer who gets this no because you know what they don't want to get it they don't want to get it there are people that get it people speak from them yeah 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 yeah. but actual reps right or actual like higher up people yeah 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 they don't get it no, because they don't want to. Because if they, they want get to it, sell implants, right? right they're gonna because if so, they get it, they're gonna have to say it's not so much about their connection e- or their whatever. Even systems that we embody, right? The engineers mm-hmm. truly sometimes. Yeah. Well, I would say not not sometimes. No manufacturer I've ever talked to, John. No yep. manufacturer. This gets me heated because 
every time I do, I just like, well, you guys, it's just so frustrating because just like you're beating a dead horse to, to death. Even more, I just can't get past it because they can't fathom mechanics and biology. They can't put yeah. it together. They got the mechanical side right. down, and they want that to be so important, Wes. They, well, they really want that want, to be paramount. Yeah, right? because because it's something proprietary, and it's something they created. It's man-made. We really wish that it could be like what we made that determines this stuff more, that we could control biology. But what Linkovicious has kind of taught us is that all we can do is anticipate what biology will do better and know that that determines what our man-made technology is capable of. But if someone talks to you about this, encourage them to go back and ask their higher-ups, hey, why aren't you guys looking at soft tissue thickness? Because I will only really understand a study, because I guarantee you when I see ankylose data, Wes, yep. when we see... For instance, ankylos, right? If you look at the protocol, they recommend two millimeter subcrustal placement. So why do you think ankylos always has great numbers on bone loss? Because they always are accounting for soft for, tissue thickness. For the thinnest tissue out there, yeah. one millimeter. <laughs> they can put it into one millimeter tissue every time, and they're never going to have a problem from a soft tissue standpoint of thickness they're already good. And it, again, it once you start thinking about this, you get your wheels turning, I promise you're going to go from denial to anger <laughs> to acceptance at some point. Well, and it, it, it'll, it'll change your everyday dentistry, Wes. It'll change your everyday dentistry. It will. And, and I think, you know, again, the take-home message is to, to, to go ahead and, you know, make sure you're checking your radiographs. Make sure if you're a surgeon, you're checking your soft tissue thickness uh, before you place your implants and making some adjustments in your surgical techniques. Don't just rely on the connection. Don't just rely on platform switching. Right. Uh, that's what Tomas is saying here. We need to have a certain, I think it's proven, we need to have a certain thickness right. of tissue. Now, why bone loss happens, John, sometimes? We may not know all the reasons why. Right. But... We know that to set ourselves up for the best case scenario, we need to start with this soft tissue thickness. Now, this next chapter, John, you know, I'm just going to tell a little story. Chapter five is subcrestal implant placement. And you know, I've been a subcrestal guy for a very long time. In fact, mm -hmm. whenever I was back, back in the days of 2000. Three, I was placing Center Pulse, which is now Zimmer, which is now Biomet Zimmer, which is, you know, crazy. But we had a crest of the bone uh, level of placement. We placed things at the crest of the bone with that particular implant. And then we moved over to actual Biomed implants. Um, it was a certain implant and that was the name of the implant. And I remember going over to my surgeon's office and he was placing most of my implants at the time because I hadn't purchased the, the, the equipment starting my own dental practice. <clears throat> and I was always one, I placed that a little deeper, placed mm -hmm. that a little deeper. Now, why I did that was I just had this thought that if we're doing surgery, that we're going to automatically have some bone loss because of the surgery. Right. So my implants, so basically you lay a flap and, you know, air touches this golden hour and you're just going to have, you know, bony necrosis. Well, Jeff, you know, uh, Frank Spears, um, Periodontists did studies on that, right? Where you lay a flap and you measure the amount of bone loss that happens every time you lay a flap. So yep. one of the things we did as residents, we said, you're going to get some bone loss whenever you do surgery, so we place our implants deeper, right? That was yep. just our protocol. And that's what a lot of people were doing at the time. So then I picked up and I started going in and I purchased into a subcrestally placed dental implant design, right? It's just part of the protocol, all right? So when I started speaking for this company right about because their soft tissue and their bone loss had been shown in a track record to be like less than a half a millimeter at 10 years. Yep. And that's what I thought, <clears throat> man, this is the great stuff. I don't want to see any more bone level bone loss. And so I started talking about this, you know, in these small little study clubs about yep. placing implants subcrestal and look at my tissue. Look right. at how good it looks, right? And and you know what I got, John? I don't know if I want to deal with going subgingival with my connection because it hurts oh. the patient. Because oh. whenever I uncover... Because it's harder to restore. Because it's harder to restore. And whenever I uncover, John, 
I don't want to have to bone profile. Do you know mm. how many times I've heard that? Yeah. When I place my dental implants. Well, here's what's here's what uh, Tomas says. He says, if tissues are thin, many clinicians simply uh, clinicians suggest simply placing the implant more deeply in bone. This method will accommodate the lack of soft tissue thickness and resolve the problem easily and quickly. So is is that the solution? Uh, some implant manufacturers, as John mentioned, like Ankylos, recommend you place them two to three millimeters subcrestal. Now we know that Tomas says if you do that, you better have a deep conus connection between two right. and five degrees more taper right? more taper you have to have that and um i i think it's interesting to watch bone remodeling and tomas talks about that and he kind of defines um remodeling in, in this book and we won't go into what bone remodeling he's talking about but one of the things that you can do in your surgeries is start one, first you need to pick an implant that you can place subcrestal. And let me, Most, let me before, before you go any further, this, I want to just specify here, Wes is talking like he's talking to surgeons. Yes. Restorative dentists. Sorry, I am placing implants. That's here. really who this affects more. Yeah. I'm just going to stop just a second because you're totally right, Wes, that the surgeon placing the implant is determining this thing, okay? But... I don't want to lose sight of the fact that, you know, restorative guys are like, yeah, I have no control over this. Well, you better get some control over this. You better get some control over this because if you don't get control over this, that difference, what does one to two millimeters mean to you as a restorative dentist on the facial number nine or the, the open embrasure now that you have between 19 and 20? You know, it matters. So you yeah. better get control over it, whether that means having a heart to heart with your surgeon or finding a different surgeon or whatever, because if you're having problems with cupping, bone loss, periimplantitis because of bone loss and exposed threads on roughened implants, if you got a situation like this that you find this new knowledge, you better get it figured out. So Wes is absolutely right. The surgeon, but restorative dentist, you don't get a pass here either. You got to mm -hmm. be on top of it, man, because this is the thing that will really mess with you. And Wes, you mentioned too, it's people saying, I don't want to place it below the tissue or the crest because of difficulty restoring. Well, well that's, where extra, you, that's where platform shifting helps us, helps us a lot, you mm -hmm. know, because we have smaller components. We can get them in and out of the implant platform connection better, even when it's placed deeply. Now, I'm not going to say that it, it's easy, but Wes... Is it supposed to be easy? Is that what it's about? It's not supposed to be easy, John. Because, let me just tell you, a few years back, I had this case where I had thin tissue. I took this lady's bridge off because it was decayed. And I didn't want to augment her tissue. It was thin. So guess what I did? I placed short implants because I had to, right? Right? And I buried the implants subcrestally two to three millimeters. Now, the issue with that is what you're saying when you do that surgically, right? And this was a guided surgery, right? It was fully guided, but I placed the implants free-handedly after I did my osteotomies. And I can remember this. It was on a Tuesday evening. And here we are at six o'clock in the evening. I'm going to uncover what simply would take an hour. Mm-hmm now turned into a two-hour procedure. Uncovering. <clears throat> just for uncovering. Just for uncovering. How much money do you make for uncovering implants, John? Zero dollars. Zero dollars. So why do I want to deal with this, right? Hmm. Because it's not what you see today and even at a year. What have we said the entire Dental Guys podcast, John, for the last four seasons of our show? Anytime we talk about this kind of thing, we don't talk about what we see at a year with implants. Mm -hmm. We talk about what we see at five and ten. Yep. I'm really concerned if you're a surgeon or if you're the surgeon and you're not paying attention to some of these things. 
Yep. Because I don't want to clean up your mess. Yep. We're aware uh, that it makes it harder. But what I guess right. we're saying is, you know what, guys? Deal with it. You know, it's harder. Yes, it is harder. But what do you want in your mouth? If you know it's true that there's less bone loss if you account for soft tissue thickness, and that means we're going to have to drive our consider driving our implants deeper when we have insufficient tissue. If it's not a case you want to augment or using one of these other techniques, guess what, so, guys? It's going to get harder, so we just have to deal with that, and there's ways to deal with it. Mm -hmm. What one way is, platform switching the implant, making sure that you have components that are smaller, but there's going to be times, like Wes said, where you're going to uncover, and it's just going to be a bad day. Yep. So keep Preps your guide, whole, have an right. idea of where your implant, all the little things, right? All so this things. means, John, let me just ask let me just ask you this question. For just your general clinician out there that's placing singles, mm -hmm. right? You're placing singles, you're not doing full arch. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about single unit implants. You're going to be replacing 19 and 30 most commonly, right? Like I'm getting ready to place 28 on this one guy because I'm going to give him 10 teeth. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give 10 teeth to chew on. So I'm placing 28. So if you go into the surgery, let's say you had a magic crystal ball and you said, you know, I know 100% that I have three millimeters of soft tissue above this surgical site. Okay. Okay. Well, then do you need to place your implant subcrestally? You do not. You do not. So that means, John, that I could choose an implant that doesn't have a deep conical connection. It could be a conical connection that is like 15 degrees or more. Yeah, like a nice, you could pick any connection just Yeah, about. like one would be like, a, just use one for an example, like a um, uh, Bio Horizon. Yeah, right? Bio Horizons, yeah. Bio Horizon. Okay, if you had a crystal ball. If you don't have a crystal ball, like if you're, if can, let me ask you this question. Can you for sure tell me how thick the soft tissue is before you do the surgery? Not for sure. I'm pretty. Not I can be pretty sure. good if I sound the bone, but I can't right. be 100. percent But you got to numb the patient up to sound the bone. So right. I would just I'm ask usually her, not. Gonna I'm just going to make an assumption. Most patients, most dentists are not sounding bone before their surgery. Right. Because if they did do that, John, then they could say, "Okay, I'm going to go to my implant stock room. If it measures three millimeters, and I'm going to choose a deeper, I'm going to choose a more shallow connection, like a 15 degree or greater." Right. But then they go and they say, you know, I sound the bone the other day, doc, and uh, this is the associate talking to the senior doc, and it measured two millimeters, mm -hmm. which is what most tissue measures, by the way. Yep. Okay. And the senior doc says, well, you better go over and get the deep conical connection implant. Right? In the right. stock room. Because you're going to need it on this case. Because you're going to need it on this case, unless you really want to augment. Right. Vertically. Or tent pole or one of those or things. Or tent pole or whatever. Well, what's the easiest thing to do, John? Sink it a millimeter. Um, yep. Now, that's what Tomas is saying here is that... Doesn't mean it, it's always the right thing to do. No, it doesn't. Sometimes you need to augment. Sometimes you need to flatten the ridge. Sometimes, I mean, blah, blah, blah. We, we, we're not prescribing that every implant needs to be one millimeter subcrestal. But can you see, guys and girls, where that could make sense? <laughs> Where if I you love, said I love our book club, John. Yeah, where if you said I just want okay, so if you're listening to this and you're like, guys, 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 <laughs> stop with the nerd stuff and just tell me what I should do. Okay, now you know that's not what this show is about, but let's just say you wanted the easiest answer. Wouldn't the easiest answer so far that we've been building the case for in this book to buy an implant system that has a really good connection and yeah. then consider do measure your tissue, but then put the implant in the appropriate depth position so that you automatically have a three millimeter amount of soft tissue. I mean, well, but John, John, most of the people listening to this show, they've got six or seven systems on the wall, so they can do whatever they want. They can just fly by the seat of their pants. Yeah, but are they doing that based on anything other than just what the restorative doctor is asking for? Oh, oh, uh oh, uh oh, surgeons, uh oh. Yeah. So, so why are the surgeons choosing the implant that they're choosing, Wes? Does it even have anything to do with biology at all? Well, What's we determining know, that? What's we determining know, that? We know, John, because of a good friend of ours that places thousands of implants a year <laughs> that he says, oh, don't I, place the I place the implants 
that my restoring docs can restore most easily. Yes. And you know and what they're doing in a lot of these offices, and some of you guys may be like offended by this, but they're having the surgeon take the impression. Because they don't want to deal with what I've dealt with for the last, you know. They're even having the surgeon place the abutment, and then they're taking a crown and bridge impression on a stock abutment, and then they're having the crown show up at the dental office no, of the stop. general dentist, and the general dentist is getting paid. Stop. The surgeons John. are even choosing the shade. Stop, John. Stop. I mean, come on, restorative dentist. Like, take a little responsibility for the outcomes that your patients have in these cases. If you're listening to this and you know that the only reason you've been using a particular implant is because either, first of all, your surgeon just said, this is what I place. Okay, now that's not always a bad answer. You need to have that discussion with your surgeon. Right. But if you're doing it, because it's easy to restore, I actually would say that in a lot of those cases, the ones that are the easiest to restore are probably either being placed in the wrong position yeah, or they're probably the wrong kind of implant that you really should be looking at in a modern dental world. Now, if we're in the 80s, if we're in the 90s even, I think we didn't know this stuff, Wes. Yeah. So is your are if you're the surgeon or you're working with the surgeon, is your surgeon still practicing in the 1990s? One of the things that man, don't get me started, right? So because again, I went to these lectures, gave these lectures, I got the same hand, you know, questions at the end. Well, I, I don't want to profile. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And I'm like, okay, well, then you can't place this implant. So here's the thing. Tomas talks, let's kind of move here forward just a little bit. There's there's things that are going to happen. Let me tell you, when you place an implant subcrestally, I don't care if it's a half millimeter to a millimeter. Most of the time on a sloping ridge, it's going to be anywhere from a half to a two millimeters in a mm -hmm. sloping ridge. You know what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to pick up a handpiece and you're going to have to pick up a profiler. Yep. I remember placing subcrestal implants before there were bone profilers. And you know what they were? What my bone profiler was before profilers was actually a thing? It was a it was a it was a four round or an eight round burr, right? Yeah. And, and scalers. And scalers and curettes. Yep. yep. And chipping away and freaking out that you're going to scratch the interface and all this stuff. It was a pain in the rear. Today's technology, we have profilers. If your system advocates placing implants subcrestally, it better come with profilers of all yep. shapes and sizes. Yep. Uh, the system we use has, is, has profilers to remove bone off of the cover screw. Right. Right? And then on top of that, it has profilers that are protective of the interface. Yep. And so you're going to have issues And we would with call, if there's one thing <clears throat> we would call for all manufacturers yes. to, to, to definitely have in their repertoire its bone profilers. How sad is it? There's systems, Wes, that still don't even have bone profilers for their multi-unit abutments for full arch. Now, even if you don't even talk about all this soft tissue stuff, any angled implant for a full arch hybrid prosthesis Don't plate get me started. is going to require profiling <laughs> to get the multi-unit on. So how about give the surgeon a hand here and, and give them a profiler? Or Because if not, talk about a bad day or talk about a bad day either for the implant or the patient or the restorative doctor or somebody. And God forbid you have to change the angulation of that multi-unit if you don't have a profiler. Uh, it's just, it's a bad situation. But then again, Wes... If your implant doesn't have a good conical connection, you you should maybe not develop a profiler because your implants maybe shouldn't be placed super subgingival. That's one thing in this chapter that he's real clear about right. that he says the author does not recommend placing implants with a wide conical connection, about 15 degrees, three millimeters below the bone in any situation, two millimeters or less should be sufficient only if the clinical situation is appropriate. However... Implants with a more taper connection can be placed as deep as three millimeters. And I'm going to just tell you guys, it's coming up when we get to the end of this. If you haven't, if you want to get a little head start, uh, the Academy News from AO 
Yeah. Just had a great point counterpoint with Linka Vicious and another gentleman talking about that exact statement here of are we increasing the risk of of a difficult periimplantitis battle mm. by placing these implants that deep? And the question is, which is the bigger issue? So well, we'll get back to that later on. But be yeah, thinking about that. Man, be thinking about that one because that's Okay, That's big. Here. It's big. It's a big deal. Listen, the point of the the point of the thing here is that one, you need to understand the type of implant you're placing, right? And as a general dentist, if you're a placer or a prosthodontist or even a periodontist, where you maybe don't have a huge referral network, right? If you're just doing the bread and butter, choose an in choose a system one that has all kinds of different sizes and lengths of dental implants. Number two, choose a system that you can place subcrestally and to to basically augment your soft tissue automatically right mm -hmm. choose a choose a system that has tools like bone profilers and healing abutments that have this more anatomical emergence profile that's under contoured like an hourglass yep choose a system and also that too i will mention and he talks about this wes and we we won't spend a ton of time on it but he talks about how one approach to this for you folks that don't like working way below the tissue. Nobody does. I mean, I don't like it. I don't want to well, do if it. We don't. Yeah. We don't, but another know. option is using an intermediary abutment, using yeah. a transmucosal type of abutment. And there yeah. are some companies that are coming out with this. In fact, if you were with us talking about uh, at the AO last year, Nobel has just released an implant that has essentially an always on one mm -hmm. abutment, if you will, one time uh, abutment that's placed as an intermediary abutment so that you now elevate the components, not only inward, you don't just move them inward with platform shifting, but you move them upward, kind of like what you would do with a multi-unit abutment for hybrid, fixed hybrid type of yeah, restoration. Like a bone channel, you're coming up out of the bone. Yep. With an abutment, you place this abutment at the time of surgery Yep. on these deep conical connection implants. So we know that one abutment, one time type situation here. Right. And now so you still work, get your, you still use that conical, that deep conical connection where it matters. It's a very European way, John. Right. And you elevate, you elevate the, the connection so you're working at the abutment level higher. Now, he points out there's still not a, a, a lot of research about what is the effect of this on peri-implant bone stability because this hasn't been done as much. And it's also problematic for maybe for single teeth because you lose sometimes some anti-rotational things here with right. having that. You're back to having an external hex connection. Does that affect things like screw loosening or is it a non-issue? That's a whole other discussion. But MIS has one that he mentions the connect abutment. Uh, yep. Nobel has one, and and it's interesting. It's interesting that this may be a way, Wes, that we could overcome this issue of having. Pe but but it costs money. It costs a lot of money. And so if you're a surgeon, and you got to now add another abutment on top of your implants, first of all, what height do you put on there? Because you maybe Dude, don't not, know. People aren't going to. People aren't going to do that. Yeah, I mean, some people will. But it's not Most easy to do. Most people are not going to do that. They don't even understand the concepts. But those that are listening to this podcast, yep. you guys, when you see that in the chapter, that's what we're talking about. We think that's one of the things that we need to kind of look at here mm -hmm. is we think that there is this transitional time in implant dentistry where we're kind of at right now. You guys think we figured it out? No. I think we're going to be seeing some pretty sweet surface technology come out over the next, over the next 10 years. I yep. think there's some special sauce that are going to come out that's going to change this, let's call it the the hybrid transition zone or whatever you want to call it. This idea of going from screw in the bone to this emergence profile, that area right there yeah. is, is I feel like, going to be the hottest research topic. And we're going to see some pretty interesting things come out. Just yeah. stay tuned for that. Yeah, I, I think that you know, these two chapters, Wes... Man, I mean, there's so much good stuff in here. And what we hope you guys have learned from this is, you know, hopefully you're, you're still, and you're probably still in denial or anger phases of this mm -hmm. idea of soft tissue thickness if this is new to you. But we want you to really digest this, go back and read this chapter a couple of times to digest it fully. Uh, talk to your surgeons. If you are the surgeon, read the research. Convince yourself 
that the implant system you're using is the right one. If you're a restorative dentist, talk to your surgeon about this. Talk about how can we deal with these subcrustally placed implants from a restorative standpoint. How are we going to make it to where it's less hassle on you, easier on the patient? Find out a system of how you're going to pre op assess these patients for thickness of tissue and how you're going to deal with it so that when the surgery day comes, you kind of you don't have to have six or seven implants on the shelf. You got some plans. This is this is one of those books that literally changes your practice. If you are not feeling that already, you haven't been listening. So we so want you me, if you if you're, yeah go I, ahead Wes. Let me go just ahead. say this. It, you're going to run into some barriers here. I, I'm just going to say this. You're going to you're going to buck the system. If you go to your surgeon and they're placing like a Nobel Active or a BioHorizon and they're like, ah, I just don't think that matters. Well, it kind of does. Mm -hmm. If you're just, if you treat every implant like a nail in a piece of wood, we got a problem, yep. right? We got a problem. And I know some of you guys are probably saying, my surgeon is not going to listen to a word of this. And some of you may not even have options right for what you can do but the, the thing is is that you have to start challenging yep because if you're young if you're in your if you're young part of your career and you're not into your 50s and 60s right you're going to be treating some real problems if you don't pay attention to this exactly so when i sent you an x-ray today of something that was really profound it'll make you sick yep when it comes to dental implant Failures. therapy and it was my case yep right my case and it's and it's like are you prepared for this and we right. are not we so are if not. you like what you're hearing um on this show if this is changing the way you are thinking about implants in your dental practice um we want to hear from you we want to know about it we want to know what you're changing we want to know what this how this is messing with you we want to know if you're angry if you're in denial if you completely disagree if you think we should use <laughs> external hex implants in every case we yeah, want to hear polish from you. collar yeah, if you think All we should stick implants four millimeters out of the tissue, we want to hear from you. But <laughs> we think that this is something that makes a difference, and that's why we put this stuff out. So if you like what we're doing, please give us a review. Please give us a five-star review hey, on Apple Podcasts. Hey, head over Podcasts. to Quintessence or Amazon and buy the book. Yeah, buy the right? book and 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 get you know tell Tomas Linkovicius that we're if you know him. We're we're reviewing. We have we haven't ever had him on the show. We'd love to have him on the show one day. Um, we certainly after doing all this, we got to get the guy on the show. Yeah. But let him know we're doing this. And please tell your friends about the show. That is the way that this show spreads. Besides podcast reviews and Apple Podcasts, besides your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram posts, it's also by word of mouth. Tell your friends, hey, this is making a difference. You need to listen to this. That's how we grow. We're going to continue to bring you this content. There's the way we always have at the highest level we can. We appreciate every single one of you for listening. We put a lot of work into this, but it's really you guys who, who continue to inspire us to be better and do better, and we're going to continue to keep pushing the envelope. So for Wes, I'm John, and this has been an episode of the Dental Guys Book Club 